For centuries, people have felt compelled to climb mountains. Other people, not me, other people. I think my knees these days could handle maybe Johnson's Mound. That's about it. But you know, there's actually a loose-knit group of folks that have successfully climbed the highest peak on every continent. But why do people do that? Why do people climb mountains? A lot of reasons, I suppose. Fame, fortune, pride, the thrill of it, the challenge of it. The famous mountain climber George Mallory died while he was trying to climb Mount Everest back in the 1920s. And once when he had been asked why he wanted to climb the mountain, his now famous reply was simply, because it's there, because it's there. You know, the folks in the Old Testament couldn't have had a more different attitude when it came to mountains. They didn't scale dangerous peaks for any frivolous reasons like fame or fortune or simply because it's there. No, they went up mountains because they've been called there by God for a special mission, a special purpose. For instance, as we all know, God called Moses up to the top of Mount Sinai to give him the law. And Scripture tells us that when Moses came down from the mountain, his face was shining so brightly because he'd been conversing with God that the other Israelites couldn't come anywhere near him. Now, today's gospel passage from St. Mark shows Jesus in the exact same tradition as Moses. In fact, who appears with Jesus on top of that unnamed mountain today? Moses does, along with Elijah, too. And Mark writes that, just like as with Moses, after Jesus spoke on the mountaintop to God the Father, quote, his clothes became dazzling white, such as no fuller on earth could bleach them. Ultimately, though, that's where the similarities between Jesus and Moses end, right there. Because the story also points out to us that Jesus' role in the Father's plan for us goes way, way beyond the role of Moses or Elijah or any of the other prophets. And in order to really understand that, to understand what Jesus' role really is, to understand who he is to us, we have to first look at the section in Mark's gospel that comes right before the passage that we just shared. And it's an equally familiar passage to us. You know, Mark records that shortly before Jesus' transfiguration, he asked his apostles two important questions. And the first one was, who do people say that I am? You remember this, right? And the second question was even more important, who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And you'll remember, too, that it's Peter who answers correctly. Peter says that Jesus is the Messiah. He's not Elijah come back from the dead. He's not Moses or one of the other prophets risen from the dead. We can almost see Peter standing there with this big smile on his face, his chest all puffed out, as Jesus tells him, correct. You are correct, St. Peter. But when Jesus then goes on to explain that being the Messiah would include him being rejected by the religious leaders and eventually his torture and his execution, well, then Peter objects. Then he objects. Because with all of the Jews of his time, most of the Jews of his time, Peter was probably expecting the Messiah to be a conquering king of some sort. It's like an invincible warrior that was going to lead Israel's armies into battle and once and for all drive the Romans out of their land and cleanse the corruption out of, all the, out of the temple. But the Messiah being killed, you know, seemingly being defeated, Peter wouldn't stand for that. He wouldn't hear that. So Jesus goes from complimenting Peter for the right answer to rebuking him for thinking as people think instead of as God thinks. Today's gospel indicates, though, that even right after that conversation, after Jesus has told him about the true nature of what it means for him to be the Messiah and what's going to happen to him, Peter's still confused. He still doesn't get it. So when Peter sees Jesus on the mountaintop today with Moses and Elijah next to him, he excitedly says, let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah as if the three of them are somehow equals, you know, the same, on the same plane. In other words, Peter is still seeing Jesus in the same way that he sees Elijah and Moses. So the Father's voice comes booming out of the clouds to set Peter straight, to set all of us straight about who his son really is, to tell them once and for all what it means for his son to be the Messiah. So the voice says, 
This is my beloved son. Listen to him. In other words, he's saying to Peter and James and John and all the apostles, and of course, all of us to this very day, we're not listening. You're not listening. Pay attention to who my son is and what he's asking of you. Pay attention. Pay attention. You know, sometimes we're no different than Peter. In other words, just like Peter, we say that Jesus is our Messiah, that he's our Savior, but then we don't live our lives as if it's actually true. That's not how we live. And it can show itself in a lot of different ways. One way is like this. You know, so often we feel completely trapped by our sins, by our imperfections, by our struggles and failures. We just hate the habits that we're stuck in, that we can't get out of. And we detest the apathy that we see in ourselves when it comes to challenging the, the evils and the sinfulness in the world around us. We also feel sometimes that we're kind of doomed in that regard, that we can never really break free, that we're never really going to conquer these things, that God can't really do anything through us, through us, to change the climate in our society. And even more tragically, sometimes we live as if he can never forgive us for some of the things that we've done, for some of our sins and our failures. In other words, we live as if Jesus is just another prophet, like Moses or Elijah. Yeah, he gives us some guidelines, some suggestions for how to live our lives, how to be nice, how to be kind people, how to please God, but nothing more, nothing more than that. But our gospel story today reminds us that Jesus is much, much, much more than that, much more than that. He's not just another prophet. No, he's actually done something to set us free from our sinfulness and the sinfulness of our world. He's died and come back from the dead. He's actually conquered the very power of sin. By his grace, by his love, by his mercy, little by little, we can be free. We can be. In our Lenten journey, then, it might help us to remember that if we truly commit our lives to Jesus, if we truly allow him to be our Messiah, to be our Savior, if we truly give him lordship over every aspect of our lives, if we truly place our trust in him, like Abraham did to God in the first reading, well, then, as St. Paul reminded us in our second reading today, God will be on our side. And who then can condemn us? Well, the answer is no one. No one. Not even ourselves.